Hello everyone and welcome to another sound design lecture. Today I will be talking about web shaping in the web audio API. This is actually directly continuing from uh, another short lecture on distortion and web shape and wave shaping where we introduce the theory behind wave shaping effects, which are a subset of distortion effects. And here we're going to talk about a programming implementation. So within the Web Audio API, wave shaping is implemented using what's known as a wave shaper node. It's an audio node just like all of the other ones. It's not a source node. It doesn't need to be started. It takes audio as input, produces a modified version of the audio at the output. So it's a type of audio effect. It can be created in two different ways, either as a method of the audio context, so context.createWaveShaper, or creating the node directly um, new wave shaper node takes as input context and optionally the parameters can be set at that point as well. Now there are two parameters with the wave shaping uh, curve or the wave shape sorry with the wave shaper node. Um, looking at the bottom of the slide the second of those parameters is oversampling and it defines whether oversampling is used. That's a way to deal with aliasing produced by wave shaping. Essentially, a signal is upsampled to a higher sampling rate. Wave shaping is performed. It introduces aliasing, but the aliasing is less problematic at the higher sampling rate and then one down samples. It defaults to none. So the assumption is that um, aliasing is not a problem, but it's not much overhead to use two or four times oversampling. But we must define a wave shaping curve. And this is the input output characteristic curve that one typically sees with distortion effects and certainly with wave shaping effects. In the Web Audio API, in JavaScript, it's a float32 array of numbers. The array can be almost any size, but it must have at least two elements. The elements of the array get mapped, so the indexes get mapped to the range of inputs from minus one to one. The values of that array at those indexes are simply the y values of the input output characteristic curve. So the very first element of the array corresponds to the input of minus one or anything less than that. And the very last element corresponds to the input plus one and anything beyond that. All values in between are simply interpolated from one array element to the next array element. If this seems a little bit confusing at the moment, it makes a lot more sense as soon as you see a couple of examples. So I'm not going to bother explaining uh, that in much more detail just yet because you will see it in about a couple of minutes. So here's a very simple example of a wave shaping curve being defined. We defined a new float32 array. We'll call that array curve, but the name doesn't really matter. And that only has two elements, one element minus one, one element plus one. So the input at the value minus one, well, if there's an input minus one, we're saying here that that value will go to an output of minus one. If there's an input of plus one, that value goes to an output of one. And we simply have a linear curve in between them. Does this actually do anything? Yes, it does, because the wave shaper assumes that anything below minus one input is fixed to whatever is the output at minus one and similarly plus one. So applying a curve like this will clip the signal to the range minus one to one. So we're going to look at two um, possible uses of the wave shaper. One for clipping as implemented in the previous lecture and one for a bit crusher. Let's start with the clipper. So here, 
we do want to clip the signal so that um, beyond a certain value, it stays fixed at that value. But we want the freedom to set that value. So if the signal is beyond 0.5, it stays at 0.5 in this example. If it's beyond minus 0.5, it stays at minus 0.5. And here's a few lines of code to create the characteristic curve, which we can use as the curve for the wave shaper node. So we specify 100 points in our array. That's the number of samples. And those are just going to be equally spaced values from um, minus 1 to 1. So here, 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 here. All of this fits 100 values. Then for each of those values with index 0 to number of samples minus 1, we specify x, which is 2 times that index divided by the number of samples minus 1. Well, if the index is 0, then x is just 0 minus 1. And if the index is um, number of samples minus 1, then ignore the minus 1 for the moment. It should be quite a small value. Or, I mean, essentially the difference between 99 and 100. But if we ignore that, we have two times number of samples over number of samples, minus 1. So it's 2 minus 1, or just 1. Essentially, for um, those samples, this x variable goes from minus 1 to 1, almost 1, in equally spaced values. So, um, now we want to take those x values and produce a curve such that um, the curve gives the proper output for clipping. If the absolute value of x is greater than 0 0.5, which means that x, which goes from minus 1 to 1, could either be below minus 0.5 or above plus 0.5, then the output curve is going to be um, this value. Let me fix that, make it a little bit better for you here. That's because I took the code from somewhere else. So if it's above 0 0.5, then it gets fixed at 0 0.5. If it's below 0 0.5, then it gets fixed at minus... Uh, sorry, if it's below minus 0 0.5, then it gets fixed at minus 0 0.5. This code produces this curve, which is exactly what we want if we want to, to clip the signal at... 0 0.5 or minus 0 0.5. Now let's look at a different type of function that can be implemented with a wave shaper. There are other ways to do this in the audio web audio API, by the way, but this is one of them. It's the bit crusher. Now the bit crusher is an audio effect, like others. So audio in, modified, or uh, uh, one signal in, one output signal out, where the output signal is typically some processed modified version of the input. This type of audio effect produces distortion by, for a fully fledged bit crusher, it usually reduces the resolution and the bandwidth, so and the frequency range of the digital audio data. But that's really affecting sampling rate. We're going to stick to reducing the resolution, and we do that by decreasing the bit depth, so as if the audio was encoded using only 4 bits or 5 bits or some smaller amount of bits than the actual encoding. How does that work? There's lots of different ways to represent quantization, but here I'm trying to do it equally over this whole range from minus 1 to 1 that all of those values between minus 1 to 1 can only be represented in so many levels. If it's 1 bit audio, there are just two levels, minus one half for all inputs between minus one and zero, and plus one half as the output 
for all outputs between 0 and plus 1. Why not minus 1 and 1? Well, that's bringing things to the extreme of the range. It's actually introducing more error than if you bring the values to the middle of the range. If it's 2-bit audio, then 2 squared or 4 levels, minus 0 0.75, and minus 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.75, and so on for 3-bit, 4-bit, 5-bit. So essentially, if we have n-bit audio, there are 2 to the n levels. In between each levels, so that range is 2 over 2 to the n. Between minus 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 here, we have 2 over 2. Here we have 2 over 4, or 1 half, between minus 0 0.75, minus 0 0.25, and so on. So, how do we construct this curve? It's actually a lot simpler than it might have seemed from the first slide. Here it is, if we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 levels, so 3 bits, 2 to the third is 8, three uh, bits for the bit depth. So we're going to specify a very large array. Um, number of samples equals 65536. I think that is 2 to the 16 there. So in other words, this allows us to work with very high bit depth. Um, we specify this array size. We specify the number of levels as just 2 to the number of bits that we're working with, as before. And then we specify x um, as a function of the index of values in the array. It's i times the number of levels divided by the number of samples. What that does is that maps the 0 to 65535, five, one less. Um, and it maps that to the range 0 to 1, or very close to 1. So 0 to 1. Now we need to take those values 0 to 1 and produce our curve, have those 8 flat regions here, the 8 quantization levels there. And we do that by 2 times math floor of x. Floor gives the largest integer value less than or equal to x, plus 1, divided by the number of levels, minus 1. You can work it out for yourself, you can plug in different inputs, but essentially, if these were values with 0 to 1 here, it gives this curve. Okay, so let's look at this code in action. Now, we're going to look at the clipper first. It's the, the simpler of the two, although neither one is that complicated. So we create a button just to start the audio context if it is not already started. And we set some threshold for clipping between minus 1 and 1. We define a source, which is going to be just an oscillator, pure sine wave, and a wave shaper node for clipping. And we connect the source to the clipper and to the output. So essentially what we're specifying here is a sine wave that we clip and we can vary where and how it gets clipped. And then every time the threshold changes, we define a new clipping curve. So if we haven't touched the threshold at all, then it should start with a... Um, with no clipping whatsoever. And then we put exactly the function that we saw on the slide to define the input-output characteristic curve. And how is this going to look? How is this going to sound, I should have said? <laughs> 
Okay, so it's hard to tell, but you should have been able to hear that the sine wave starts changing into something more and more like a square wave as I lower the threshold for clipping. I also opened up the console over here just to check that there were no mistakes, no error messages being produced. Now let's look at the bit crusher. Same basic idea as before, but here my control is controlling the bit depth, ranging from 1 to 16, starting with high bit depth. We have an oscillator, we pass it through the wave shaper, so source is being bit crushed to the destination. We start the oscillator, um, exactly the curve that you saw before, there is really no change. And of course, once we define this curve, we set it as the curve for our wave shaper. Let's have a listen. Okay, and what you should have heard there is the oscillator again being turned into something like a square wave when it reaches only uh, one bit resolution. It is basically a square wave oscillating back and forth, but in between it has this sort of step discretized sine function uh, form. And when you go to low bits, one, two, three, four, you should hear quite a difference. If you don't hear it during the lecture where it's going through my speakers, the output um, of the recording device, and then encoding into uh, MP4 format and everything else. If you don't hear it there, please try out the code yourself, listen to it at home, and try it with uh, various different types of inputs to hear the effect of bit crushing. And that concludes this short lecture on implementing the Wave Shaper within the Web Audio API. If you have any questions, please get in touch. Thanks very much.